Hello, I'm Christopher McCarthy from the American Chemical Society, and welcome to this news briefing from the American Chemical Society's Spring 2019 National Meeting in Orlando. We're joined today by Dr. Joseph Richardson of the University of Melbourne. He's studying nanomaterials that give plants super abilities. Dr. Richardson? Hi there. Yeah, it's, it's good to be here. Um, so we look at all sorts of metal organic materials and how they can give unique functionality to organisms outside the scope of evolution. So pretty much what, what we did initially, we were inspired by some research from Sweden. And um, they used an ancient technique of dying plants where you cut the stem and you let dye just come up naturally through the, through the plant and stain the flower petals. So they did it with a conductive polymer, but we thought it would be even cooler to assemble the nanomaterials actually inside and throughout the plant. And um, what we did is we used two different types of MOFs. Those are metal organic frameworks, and they're composed of very small organic molecules and metal ions. We know plants love both of those things, and as the plants suck these up, the nanomaterials assembled. We used um, fluorescent MOFs just because they're really easy to visualize and they can be used for sensing. And um, we, we saw that they'd grow throughout the plant. In fact, we didn't even have to cut the stem and use the ancient flower dyeing technique because the precursors were so small that they could be taken up through the roots. So this was the first time people assembled nanomaterials inside of a plant and went through the roots, so it was a non-damaging technique. Actually, can we go back real quick? And um, what we could do with that, so we did two different uh, colors of fluorescence, depending on the rare earth metal we used. Terbium gave us green, europium gave us orangish red, and um, these moths had been shown to sense small molecules like acetone outside of organisms, and we thought it would be interesting to put them into plants since acetone can be found in some wastewater and can be harmful to organisms. So we saw that the moths retain their ability to sense acetone. More recently, we've been looking at using the moths to coat the outside of plants. So instead of giving them some unique internal function, we're giving them some protective capacity. And the fluorescent moths absorb UV across pretty much the whole spectrum. And even in harsh UV that normally doesn't even make it to Earth. What we saw is that if the plants were coated in these moths, they could actually not get damaged under long-term exposure to UV. And we think this could have applications outside of Earth. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? And please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. I'm interested in looking more at the applications, because I understand the sensing applications, but I guess that's pretty niche. Yeah. But then I was thinking on the food side, which would be really interesting, because they contain moths, um, isn't that a drawback in terms of, you know, these are metal organic compounds, nanoparticles, we're never going to be able to eat or want to touch plants like that, even if you could improve photosynthesis? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And there's sort of two responses to that. One is that if you've ever taken an iron supplement, you've probably eaten the same ingredients as a moth. So a lot of, some moths are made of iron, some are made of molecules like fumaric acid, and a lot of iron supplements um, are actually composed of those two ingredients. So eating that, if anything, might be, could, could be better for you. Not all moths would be good for you, though. And um, all the moths we use in these studies, we make sure that they're degradable so that you can selectively at any point um, spray a very small amount of molecules onto that to degrade it. And um, they can be chelators that will remove the metals or um, slightly different pH regime depending on the moth. So I agree, they're not necessarily something that you would always want to eat, especially since there's so many types of moths, but we are trying to um, approach the safety aspects of that. In that case, how could they improve photosynthesis? How do they actually achieve that, and by how much? Right, right. So um, the picture, I'm, I'm not sure if it's up or if they can project it up, but when we do the external coatings, um, this is taking UV light, and it's converting it into visible light. And depending on the metal we use, we can convert the light to essentially any wavelength of light we want. We know photosynthesis has um, functions better under certain wavelengths, which is why with hydroponics they have LEDs of very specific wavelengths. 
And so we think it could actually be used to boost um, photosynthesis in that regard. So taking the UV light and converting it to more visible light. And as it is, the plant would still be getting the normal visible light they normally would. Okay, thank you. Bela yeah. Buslig, uh, American Chemical Society. <clears throat> uh, it, uh, these moths that uh, that you take uh, take up would they be perhaps applicable to uh, to uh, for flower preservation for uh, for essentially keeping uh, keeping the flower look like the uh, the real thing uh, thing uh, essentially forever for for a specimen in in an exhibit or. or uh, uh, there are ways and means that that they're doing it now, but uh, but they're very expensive, very elaborate. This might uh, this looks like a, a, a rather e interesting way of perhaps achieving the same thing. Yeah, that's that's a really great question. Um, so we've been using these moths for preserving biomolecules for long times, but we haven't specifically looked at the plants. Um, we joked about it and kept one of our flowers for a pretty long time versus a control. And it was better, but it didn't look pristine. But that's something we can definitely look more into. Now, would uh, would you think that uh, that it, taking it internally would be the uh, uh, the way to go, or or externally, or both? I think in that regard, we'd probably want to do both to just really seal it throughout, and um, we'd have to choose them off quite carefully, just so that it wouldn't. Um, wouldn't damage it over time. We probably wouldn't want them fluorescing in that instance. But we use some non-fluorescent ones, and yeah, I think that's that's very viable. Um, Thank you, Charles Burquist from Science Friday. Um, what percent of the plant becomes moth? Yeah, yeah that, that's uh, a great question. We have that in our first study. We looked a little bit at the elemental analysis. Um, and it depends on, on the segment of the plant. So the stem, you know, it's, it's quite, uh, it's, it's like bark. There isn't a whole lot of soft organic matter. It's pretty hard. And there, I think our metal concentration got up to about 10%. Um, and we estimated that about probably half of that was moth. And the other part was just the metal ion going into the plant. And so, yep. And, and the thing is, a lot of that's inside the stem. So it's actually in kind of free space. So it's not that the plant is getting replaced with moth, it's that all the cavities and gaps are getting moths grown in them. And is it, a, you feed it more, it takes up more, or is there a, a maximum loading that it will reach and say, I'm done? That, that's a good, good question. We didn't look at a maximum. Um, we put in a concentration that's, uh, for our highest concentration, was similar to about salt water. And so we didn't want to go much higher than that because we were worried about osmotic issues where the cells would start rupturing. Um, and in that case, we also can get some clogging. As the moths grow, as they're being taken up, they're growing. And so the longer you wait and the more precursors that are there, you'll eventually kind of seal off the stems. And then if you don't balance it right, you won't get any moth growth higher up the plant or not as much up the plant. Um, so yeah, we're still fine tuning some of that. Yeah. How do you prevent it from all, you know, if it's being drawn in through the roots from self-assembling yeah. just above the roots and nothing gets upstairs? So um, one approach we use, especially for the fluorescent ones, is that we load the organic molecule first, for example, and then later we, we load the metal. And we know they're going to have, they're going to move through the plant at different speeds because they're different sizes. And then when they get together, they can self-assemble. So that's one approach we've taken is separating it. The other is just lowering the concentration. Laura Cassidy with ACS. Can you talk more about the applications beyond Earth that you alluded to? Yeah, so that's, that's some of the most exciting stuff um, for myself and my colleagues who all work with this. And we know that you know, NASA wants to grow and is growing plants in space. Um, but often this is in the International Space Station. China just tried to grow some plants on the dark side of the moon worked until night came and, and they got, they froze very quickly. So we're hoping kind of like to preserve flowers that these can help preserve, but also as they're being, plants are being bombarded by cosmic rays and very harsh radiation that we don't experience on Earth, that these moths can help, for example, by converting very, very harsh UV that doesn't penetrate the ozone layer that will be on Mars into visible light, 
we know that there's not a lot of visible light on Mars because um, it's so far away. So we're hoping to kind of kill two or three birds with one moth, essentially. <laughs> hey, this is Katie Cottingham from ACS. So um, how do you harvest the moths if you're making them inside and you want to use them for another application? Or, or is that something you have in mind? Right. Um, we haven't done that yet. That's actually, that's actually a great question because there's a lot of interesting science that could be done um, with that approach. If we were going to do that, we'd probably have to talk with the cellulose guys who are having their symposium here and see how they normally degrade the cellulose to kind of try to kick those moths back out. And we have, um, we have some collaboration with those guys, actually, um, because we're trying to look at the fundamental science of where, what specific biomolecules these moths grow on. And we found they, they do really love cellulose. So yeah, that's a good question. OK, thank you. Uh, the archive version of this session will be posted soon at bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore Orlando 2019. And please join us for our next press conference at 10.30 AM on making lead pipes safe. Thank you.